Hello, everybody, and welcome to the sixth Modest Means Healthline, MMH for short, webinar for small businesses. My name is Margaret Lorenz, and I'm a staff attorney at the MMH. My nickname is Mia Lorenz, so if you hear that, your ears are not fooling you. I answer to both names. Today, we are taking you through topics involving unemployment insurance, employment services, and labor relations. All of these areas are handled and managed through the New Mexico Department of Workforce Solutions. So we are so very pleased to have Deputy Secretary Martinez of the Department of Workforce Solutions and others who I'll introduce in a moment present to you CWS 101 for Small Businesses. We are recording this webinar as we have recorded all prayer webinars. To find it, go to the State Bar New Mexico website click on Bar Foundation, click on Modest Means Helpline, then click on Mod MMH Publications, and then it will appear in a day or so. The five prior webinars are already up. We're gonna to go to the second slide next. This is our disclaimer slide. This expresses important things like this presentation is intended for general information and the views and opinions you may hear expressed are not necessarily the position of the New Mexico State Bar Foundation. Thank you for your understanding. The next slide explains that the MMH helps people who are at or below 500% of the federal poverty level with civil legal problems. The MMH advises on divorce, child custody, kinship guardianship, domestic violence, landlord tenant law, small business issues, consumer and probate issues to name a few. We do an intake process to determine eligibility and examine for any potential conflicts. And from there, the caller would be called back by one of five staff attorneys. I am one of the staff attorneys. And if you have a small business situation, you will very likely talk to me. Our attorneys give legal advice over the phone. And if the case warrants, for example, if the client is very low income and worthy, we attempt to make pro bono referrals on behalf of the client. With me is the New Mexico State Bar Foundation Legal Services Director, Attorney Casey Daniel, who leads, among other things, the Modest Means Helpline, which means she juggles many things, and lucky for us, she's an excellent juggler. <laughs> we also have, as I mentioned, Deputy Secretary Mar Marcos Martinez. We are expecting and hope that Cabinet Secretary Sarita Nayer will attend. We have Kim Souders, the Labor Relations Director, and Raquel Gomez, the Special Projects Coordinator for the Department of Workforce Solutions. Just a few housekeeping things. We will attempt to get questions answered as they appear. Please type them in the question and answer part of the Zoom. And from here, I'm gonna hand it over to Deputy Secretary Marcos Martinez. Thank you. You're muted. Okay, sorry, let's try that again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you everybody for, for being here and thank you Mia and thank you Casey. Um, uh, I wanna start off by just uh, apologies from our uh, cabinet secretary, Sarita Nair. She really wanted to be here today. Um, there's still a chance that she may join us. Um, so we'll we'll see how that works out. She got called to a last, meeting, me last minute meeting at the governor's office. So we, I want to start by talking a little bit about the Department of Workforce Solutions and sort of the three buckets of work that we do here at Department of Workforce Solutions. Um, the first piece is unemployment insurance. So there's two pieces to that, right? There's the unemployment tax, which are the taxes that we collect from employers to put into a fund to be able to pay uh, benefits to those folks who lose their jobs through no fault of their own. And that's the unemployment insurance or the unemployment insurance claims piece. Um, way to the right, um, or on the screen there, um, labor relations, um, we handle, and, and that's Kim's, uh, Kim's division, but we handle um, wage and hour issues, uh, human rights, paid sick leave, public works, and, and child labor. Um, in the middle of this, uh, of this, uh, of this slide um, is employment services, and these are, these are more services geared toward um, a lot of these services are geared to helping uh, both large and small businesses with any kind of 
um, employment related challenges that that they may be having any type of workforce challenges. So um, under employment services, we have the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, which are uh, grants that come to us um, to provide different types of things like um, training to uh, those individuals that need training before they find work, um, to employers to be able to subsidize wages while they train employees. Um, and um, so that's what workforce innovation and opportunity is. Our, our business outreach, we have, um, I would say close to 30 staff statewide that are, that, are, um, that are located in each of our workforce connection centers. And their job primarily is to work with businesses in their communities on any kind of workforce challenges, whether it be um, filling positions, whether it be high turnover, um, uh, it, it could potentially be um, current staff that need to be upskilled, those types of things. And our, our business outreach staff would take care of that. We also oversee the registered apprenticeship programs in New Mexico. So we have over 2,000 apprentices um, now statewide working with several companies around the state. Um, and we also have our AmeriCorps program, which is the volunteer program um, um, similar to the Peace Corps, but this is um, in, in, in the United States. Um, and we also manage the H-2A program uh, for agricultural workers and the Migrant Seasonal Farm Worker program. Um, and we also have a division of economic research and analysis that basically provides data to employers. Um, it helps us provide um, data to job seekers on labor market demands, all of those different types of things. So they basically provide um, any kind of workforce data um, internally to our agency and externally to those employers as well. And then on the bottom, you'll see in, in red, um, we, we do get mistaken for workman's comp a lot. We, are not, uh, we do not handle uh, workman's compensation. Um, so let's talk really quick about our uninsur unemployment insurance program. So um, it, it's important that everybody understands that this is a joint federal and state program. Um, employers within the state are the ones that fund the program and they pay for the, uh, they, they pay through their unemployment tax. They pay their unemployment insurance tax uh, and, and that goes into a fund that uh, we as the department manage. It's, we're not allowed to use it on anything but to pay actual benefits um, to those people that are deemed eligible for unemployment uh, compensation. Um, the federal government contributes in that they cover the staff um, and they cover um, our costs as a state agency to administer um, the unemployment insurance program. Um, and, and basically this was started as a depression, depression era uh, safety net to help those folks who lose their job through, uh, through no fault of their own. Um, I'm going to go over a few myths that um, that we we uh, we get a lot of calls from from businesses that talk about some of these things. So um, I'll, I'll go through the first one, and it says that um, employees who are fired cannot get unemployment insurance, and um, that's that's the truth. Um, unless an employer can prove that the employee was fired for cause after receiving warnings, the employee is eligible for UI. So whoever the um, initiating party is on the separation, um, that's the party that um, holds, that has to provide the burden of proof of why the employee was uh, terminated, or if an employee um, initiated the, the separation, then they would have to show why they separ why they left the employer. Um, and it has to be good. It, it has to be with good cause. And all of that is defined for us in, in all of our federal um, guidelines. Um, the next one is employees can quit their jobs and rely on unemployment. So that is also uh, truth. An employee who voluntarily quits their job is not eligible for unemployment insurance benefits. So um, again, if somebody voluntarily quits and they don't have good reason for leaving, uh, the job they they had, um, uh, you know, um, they just didn't like it or those types of things. Um, they would not be eligible for unemployment insurance. So what happens is when somebody files for unemployment insurance, a notice goes immediately to all of those employers um, that they worked for for the last year and a half, and then those employers get have an opportunity to respond to say why that employee was let go or if they have any idea why that employee voluntarily quit. Um, an, another one is this employee hasn't worked for me for a while, so can I ignore this notice? And uh, 
that's that's a truth as well. It's very important to confirm dates of separation so that the employee who's eligible for unemployment does not get charged to your account. So like I said, when they come in and file, we look two years back at all the wages they had in their prior two years. And if you are in a, an employer in that base period, you will get a notice no, uh, um, saying that they are filing. Um, in order for your account not to get uh, charged as an employer, you need to make sure that you respond to the uh, questionnaire and you let us know why they are no longer working for you. For you. Um, some tips for employers as far as unemployment insurance goes. Um, document everything um, because if someone files for unemployment insurance against you and you don't feel that they're eligible, um, we're going to ask for specific documentation on that. So any type of separation documents, any kind of um, uh, documentation that you have in regards to the separation, please hold on to that and document that. Um, any kind of proof of independent contractor, we do get um, folks that come in that say, um, they don't believe they should have been an independent contractor, but they were. Um, but now they feel like they should get unemployment benefits. So um, there has to be some kind of proof that the employer let them know that they were an independent contractor in the in the process. Um, please pay attention to your third party administrator. If you have a third party administrator that um, that that manages your unemployment insurance um, processes, um, uh, like this says, trust but verify. Um, Will will that third party administrator pay you back for any penalties that you incur because of their mistakes? A lot of times an employer will want to um, come back after somebody's been granted unemployment insurance and say, well, I didn't know or I wasn't notified. If your third party administrator is the one that gets the notices through your unemployment insurance account, then it's on them to make sure that they let you know um, what's going on. So just just be careful with that. Um, keep your contact and account information up to date and use a method that you will check. So any notices that we have, if you're, uh, when, you, when, when an employer creates an account on our system, we ask them how they prefer to get notified of anything that's happening with their account, whether it be an internal email, an external email, um, uh, um, uh, US Postal Service mail, what, whatever it is. So just, just make sure that you keep that um, information up to date um, because that's, that's another thing, um, we, we cannot, um, we cannot do an appeal based on the fact that the employer did not check their email or did not uh, check their mail. Um, we, that's under under our federal guidelines. That's that's not um, enough for us to um, to to move something to to an appeal. Um, and then um, we do have some tax re uh, representatives. This is an old slide, but we do have some unemployment insurance tax representatives statewide. Not a lot of them, about four or five. Um, but then we also have some here in Albuquerque that um, if you call the 800 number that they will that they'll work um, through any kind of challenges that you're having with unemployment insurance. Um, under employment services, we have 20, the number changes a little bit, but 24 um, workforce connection centers around the state. Um, and again, um, their primary focus is to work with two customers, one with those job seekers that are looking for work. Um, but we do a lot for New Mexico businesses as well. And, and we mentioned some of those before, but we, we, we do a lot of recruitment, customized uh, recruitment. We do um, social media marketing for those employers that are recruiting employees, pre-screening, um, and anything to do with the hiring process, anything to do with the training process, um, we can help facilitate that. All of the programs um, that we administer are at no cost for our employers. Um, let's talk about this is this is uh, the secretary's uh, favorite slide. So let's the slide. The, the green line is basically our um, uh, total employment for for New Mexico. Um, and you can see um, we're above total employment that we were pre pandemic. Um, pre pandemic, we were a little under 870,000 people um, engaged in the workforce and we're close to 890,000 now. Um, the slide that really um, she likes to highlight or the, 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 the section that she likes to highlight is, is the bottom, the sort of orange, and I don't know if that's teal, I don't know what color that is, but um, uh, the, uh, the, the orange line um, shows the number of folks that are unemployed in the state, 
And then the uh, teal line shows those job openings in the state. So it's important when you look at this that normally the way the economy works, we normally have more unemployed folks than we do jobs. So at that point, employers can be a little bit more selective on who they're hiring. They usually have um, several um, resumes for each individual position. Um, that's what we normally see. But if you look at around May 2021, the lines crossed. And what we're seeing now, and those of you uh, employers, I mean, this is why um, we struggle with finding, um, finding employees. Um, the, uh, the number of unemployed is way down from those um, job openings that are available in the state. And we see that every day in our offices as well. It's, it's, it's tough and we know employers are struggling with, um, with, with finding workers. But the, the way this works right now is that if we were able to get everybody that was unemployed and get them employed, and this is minus the fact that maybe skills don't match all of that, but if we could get everybody employed that's unemployed, we would still have a gap. We would still have 32,000 more jobs than people. So um, there's, as a state, we're going to have to look at how we, um, how we address that. Um, we're seeing a pretty flat when it comes to population gain in New Mexico. We're not gaining, but we're not losing. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty flat, um, but we still have that big jobs gap that we've, um, that we've got to, that we've got to look at and, and address. Um, next slide is just our um, unemployment insurance rates. Um, we've got counties with the highest unemployment rate, um, Luna, Sierra, Cibola, uh, McKinley. You can see those rates there. Um, counties with the lowest unemployment rate, of course, Los Alamos has been there forever. Um, Eddy and Curry County, those are in the, uh, in, in the eastern part of the state, and then DeBaca Union. Um, so those are those are, are things that we have there. Uh, if you look at the color code, the, those that are in red or I think that's like a pink, um, that's, those are the ones, unemployment rates that are worse than the state average. Um, the dark red are worse than the state average and worsening. And then you have green that are better than state average and dark green that are better than state average and, um, and getting even better. Um, I talked about this a little bit in, in the previous slide, but these are, these are services that our local workforce connection centers around the state can help employers work uh, with. So we have an applicant database that we can search for qualified candidates. I will tell you based on the previous slide that there aren't as many folks out there looking for work. So employers have to get creative with, with how they want to do that. And, and we can help with that. Um, we talk about applicant recruitment, paid and unpaid marketing, um, outreach to educational institutions. In some cases, we do have staff that actually live at the community colleges and universities. So um, we can have, we can help the employer get an in there when it comes to recruiting those folks that are in, in those institutions. Um, we also do outreach to community organizations, um, direct marketing through, again, our workforce uh, connection centers. Um, we arrange hiring events for both the private sector and public sector anytime they need to, uh, they need to do some, some hiring of, of individuals. Um, we we pre-screen and, and schedule for interviews if the employer wants. Um, we have skill assessments that we are um, that we have at our disposal to use to either either verify abilities for those folks that are that are interviewing for positions, or we've been using them actually with employers to um, when they're looking at either promotional opportunities and they're trying to test the skill sets to see who's uh, what they have or even when they're just looking at their workforce as a whole to see maybe where the weaknesses are, what, where, 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 the, where the weaknesses in that workforce are and how they can target um, training. So we have those available. Um, we have several tax credits and programs. Um, there's a couple of examples here. Our work opportunity tax credit really talks to employers who hire folks from specific categories like ex-felons or disabled veterans or those types of things. Um, there's tax credits available that we can help the employer facilitate anywhere from $2,400 to $9,600. Uh, those tax credits would go directly uh, to the business for hiring um, individuals in those categories. We also have a federal bonding program that where we, if an employer hires somebody and they can't get them bonded, um, we issue $5,000 uh, uh, federal bonds. 
Um, and we cover for the like the first six months of employment to give an employee an opportunity to prove themselves. So those those are just a couple of the uh, programs that we have that benefit employers um, directly. We also have a pre-apprenticeship program that um, we we are working with high schools to try and build a pipeline, right? Um, future workforce. And uh, we work with businesses in our pre-apprenticeship program to try and open up slots for students to get some good, solid work-based learning. Um, we cover 100% of the wages and we also cover the workman's comp for that program. Um, and all we ask for from the employers is just a really positive work experience for that youth, um, hoping that, you know, when they finish high school, if they don't go to college or even after college, we can come back and get them in that, in that industry that they, that they worked for. So um, some retention strategies. So um, these, these are things that we're learning in working with the private sector. So again, we work with private and public sector. Um, we do a lot of work with private sector and businesses and employers. And it's nice because we get to see some of the innovative things that those employers are doing. And, and one of the things that really stuck to us when they talked about um, what they're learning is that they are now in sort of two businesses is the way they explained it to us. They're in the people business and they're in whatever business they're in, right? So they have to worry about their product and how they do that. And businesses are usually pretty good at doing that. But now they have to be in the people business as well. You have to really focus on your employees. Um, the new group of employees that are coming in are a little bit different. You've got all kinds of different generations in the workforce right now. Um, but, you know, they want to they wanna know about growth in the company. They want to know about purpose. They want their job to have a purpose. Um, they're looking at health benefits and personal health. Um, of course, they, they want money. Um, they're looking at a sense of accomplishment. They're looking at creativity. They're looking at, uh, at you know, they want to be able to continue to learn um, in their jobs. So, again, just, just what we're learning from the private sector, they're really having to focus on these types of things in order to be able to retain um, employees. It's so hard to find new employees right now that they're really, really focusing on retention of the current uh, workforce that they have. Some of the things we're doing in relation to uh, to infrastructure, we're really working with um, our community colleges and our high schools to try and incentivize and talk to students about um, college is great and college works. Um, it may not be for everybody. And let's talk about a lot of the, uh, the trades that are out there, what kind of salaries they pay, what kind of job opportunities are out there. So if any uh, we have any businesses here that are in that type of um, are in the trades business. Um, we are encouraging um, students to take a look at a lot of those trades. Um, on the left, you see a picture of some people using virtual reality. We have a semi truck that we um, that we purchased um, they, through the leg through legislature funding, um, and we take it around the state. And what it has is it has twelve virtual reality stations that talks to the students about. Um, it, it gives them a hands on opportunity to look at all of the different trades. Um, it's got um, it's got a lineman bucket that you get in. It doesn't move, but you put the virtual reality on and you run the the, the controls, and it feels like you're up in the air. It feels like you're moving around. Um, we've got virtual welders, virtual heavy equipment um, uh, simulators, CDL truck driver simulators, all of those. And again, um, please contact our office if you'd like if you have any events that you think that would be valuable in. But the goal there is really just to um, expose students to um, the different opportunities that are out there, what kind of salaries are out there, and, uh, and those types of things. Okay, I'm going to turn over the next, I think, one or two slides to, uh, to Kimberly uh, Sauters. Like she, I don't know if you introduced yourself, Kim, but go ahead. Okay, no problem. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having us. My name is Kim Souders, and I am the Labor Relations Director for the agency. Um, the Labor Relations Division, uh, when you think of uh, labor relations, think of um, enforcement. We are, my division um, enforces all of our statewide labor laws, um, including wage and hour, um, making sure people get paid, um, paid correctly on time. Uh, we oversee the overtime rules. Um, we oversee, um, make sure that people are not um, 
uh, receiving, um, or I'm sorry, being penalized for um, deductions that they should not be um, seeing on the paycheck. We also um, oversee the second, um, uh, I'm sorry, the second here is public works. We oversee the public works unit. Um, then child labor, we, we uh, enforce our child labor laws. Um, so that includes <clears throat> ensuring that children are not working in, ha in any hazardous occupations. Um, children who are under the age of 16, uh, 14 and 15 year olds must um, uh, apply for a work permit. And the our agency then uh, verifies that uh, the youth, the minor who would like to um, have the job is is um, making you know making sure that we are um, not putting them in a in a hazardous occupation like I said before and then we also oversee our paid sick leave our paid sick leave law and our human rights act and Marcos if you'll just go through next slide <clears throat> okay <clears throat> one of the things that we're seeing every day folks is paid sick leave issues um, there's a lot of employers. Uh, large and small throughout the state who are unfamiliar with our paid sick leave, um, with the paid sick leave um, act. And just so that everyone knows, the, um, the, the, the law has been in effect since July 1st of, of 2022. Um, employers with a more general paid time off policy may not meet all requirements of the act. So that's, that's a big myth. Uh, that we see. We see employers saying, well, we don't really have to honor um, paid sick leave because we offer a generous PTO program, paid time off program. Um, oftentimes, um, that's not that's not true. Um, the Paid Sick Leave Act must uh, still comply um, any anytime uh, an employer has to offer sick leave benefits, it has to comply with um, the Paid Sick Leave Act. PTO may not cover all of the, the, the requirements of paid sick leave. Another myth um, that we see is that employers cannot offer cash in lieu of leave under the act. Um, that is true. A lot of, uh, a lot of employers um, feel like they can go ahead and offer um, employees cash and pay uh, in lieu of the sick leave that, that the employee um, accrues. And, and you can, as an employer, you can't do that. That's against the law. The next that we see <clears throat> are, excuse me, everybody, I'm having some throat problems. Healthcare and restaurant industries are um, struggling most with compliance with paid sick leave, with the paid sick leave law. Um, I would say that that's probably 80% of the claims that we receive right now are from uh, workers in both of these industries. Um, again, large and small um, employers are, are just unaware and it's not, you know, it's, it's, I, oftentimes we don't think it's intentional. It's unintentional. Um, employers just are not aware of uh, the requirements of paid sick leave. Um, anytime that you have questions about paid sick leave, please feel free to contact us. Uh, we would really like to help you um, and you know, provide education and outreach as much as we can versus receiving claims from um, employees that you know, we, we could have prevented this in the first place. So rely on us, please. Next slide. Okay, wage and hour, uh, common issues. We see a lot of wage and hour claims coming through these days. Uh, a couple of years ago, we um, we were able to get a hold of our of our case backlog simply because employees were you know employees and businesses we didn't we weren't working right so we were we were really able to get a hold of our backlog. That's not the case today. Um, employees are back to work, and employers <clears throat> sometimes just don't understand <clears throat> our overtime and our wage laws. Excuse me. I think it's still allergy season in New Mexico. Okay, so um, what we see the most is that employers do not pay out earned vacation leave when an employee separates. Um, this is uh, very important that employers uh, should know that um, really earned vacation leave must be paid anytime the employee separates. Uh, confusion on overtime rules and, and unlawful dedu deductions. Um, 
Anytime an employee works over 40 hours or more in a work week, they must receive time and a half. Um, there's employees who um, submit claims. We see claims where employees work 60 hours a week or 50 hours a week, and anything above the 40 is not overtime. Um, that is, of course, um, also against the law. Overtime is required, anything over 40. And then there's a lack of understanding of proper and lawful use of tip pooling practices. We're seeing a lot of this in, in the restaurant industry as well. Um, tip pooling is not illegal as, as we describe here, but employers do need to track wages and ensure that employees are earning minimum wage. Um, so really the, the bottom line here is that uh, wait staff are allowed to um, uh, use or rely on tip pooling. However, um, you know, uh, people who are um, hostesses, uh, kitchen staff, um, you know, uh, individuals who are, as we say, busing tables, those folks should not be in tip pooling. Um, that, you know, it just gets, it gets very confusing. Um, anytime if you are a, a, a restaurant, um, or in the service industry, please be sure and keep all records, all pay records, because anytime an employee submits a claim to us, uh, we investigate and we will rely on um, all payroll records, um, employment records when the employee started work, if they're still employed, any of, the, any of those pieces are really important in our investigation. So we rely upon that. And then another thing that we're seeing in wage and hour, a common issue, is misclassification of employees. Um, a large part of this is, again, um, in, in the healthcare industry. Um, you know, employees, employers feel that um, they should just go ahead and, and classify an, an employee as an independent contractor and not pay them as an employee in, in their agency. and um, you have to be very, very careful with that. Uh, misclassification is a serious issue. Uh, we take it seriously. And again, we are here to help you. If you have independent contractors, if you want to hire an independent contractor and you feel that they um, should be um, classified that way versus an employee. And again, we can help. Um, so I, I think that that's the, uh, those are the slides on, on my behalf. Uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. I have a question or two, if it's okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, and it was just on that subject. I get a lot of questions um, from clients about independent contractor versus employee. And I guess one general question I have, is there a resource or a person at DWS that they can call to talk to to sort of flesh that out? Or is that something you all do? Yeah, good, great question, Mia. Thank you. Yes, that is absolutely something that we can do. So um, here is our website. And if you, um, let's see, where would you, let's see, uh, uh, wage and hour is here under rules and regulations. If you select wage and hour, then that will give you the phone number to our wage and hour office. And we can put you in touch with um, a specialist who can explain um, the the mis the uh, misclassification um, and um, your your question would be answered. Okay, and then <clears throat> I've also had a question come up from an employer about um, are when a New Mexico when a human rights the Human Rights Bureau takes on a case are those cases confidential or are they public record? How does that work? Yeah, that's that's a great question as well. Um, it, there, there's, um, and it's not really an easy question, um, an, an, an answer that's easy uh, to that question. It just, I'm just gonna say this, it just depends. Um, while we're the, in the investigation, um, all of that information is confidential. It is when we are finished with the investigation and we issue a probable cause or a non-probable cause determination mm -hmm. that the um, Information of Public Records Act comes into play. So we can, um, you know, people can request uh, a full copy of the investigation and we're just 
really careful on what we can disclose and what we can't. Um, personal health information is, as we all know, you know, very guarded. So oftentimes when we get a request um, on a file or an investigation for an ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act um, mm -hmm. complaint, then a lot of that is going to be kept confidential. Okay. Does that help, Mia? Answer? Yes, it does. Um, and then Deputy Director Martinez, I had a question on your stuff because I get asked this quite a bit. Is there, from an employer standpoint, is there a minimum number of warnings that is expected or a good rule of thumb to be given before terminating an employee for cause? Or is there any such guideline like that? Or is it just, it depends? N not a specific guideline. I know that we usually will see um, uh, three um, different three. types of warnings, like like a writ like a verbal and a written and a, um, but the, the key is going to be um, your policy manual. Um, what's the employer's policy? Because we look at when, when somebody files a claim, we look at the policy that that specific employer has. And then we base our decision a lot of times on how if that policy was followed or not. So if the employer specific policy says, you know, they've, they've got to have a written and a verbal and a written and then termination, and that's what they did, then they're fine. If the policy says that, but they terminated without any type of, of warning, then there's a chance that that person would be eligible for benefits. So um, a lot of it is based on, on what that employer policy says. Okay. And we have a question in the question and answer. People ask me frequently where they should start if they feel they have been discriminated against by an employer or wrongfully terminated. Usually they can't afford a private lawyer. Where should I send them? I'll let you answer that and then maybe I can answer it too. <laughs> yeah. um, go ahead, you, you would like for me to go ahead, Marcos? Would, or? I, I, can, I can start. So sure. just um, un, unlawfully terminated on the unemployment insurance side, we always encourage individuals to file that unemployment claim. Um, because they'll file it, they'll put um, the ration, what, what they felt happened, um, we'll always verify with the employer to make sure that that's correct. But um, it, it's important that they file right away and let us go through the process of making that determination. Um, because um, a lot of times people will wait a month or two thinking they're not eligible or thinking I'll find a job and they, and they don't. And it's very difficult to get an unemployment insurance claim backdated. So um, the, the idea for on the unemployment side, and Kim's going to have something on discrimination, but on the unemployment insurance side, we, we always recommend file the claim and let us make the determination. Um, same on the side of labor relations with our Human Rights Bureau. If any individual feels that they've been um, discriminated against, um, fired or let go for um, reasons uh, violating their protected status, their equal pay rights, um, their genetic information, uh, if it's a, an unlawful um, uh, firing for an ADA accommodation, then they should go ahead and get um, and, and file a, uh, a claim with our uh, Human Rights Bureau. Again, we will take that claim, we'll take the information, we'll investigate. Um, right now we have a staff of seven investigators um, and you know, we'll, we will do our very best to um, get to the bottom of, of whatever has happened uh, from the employee's side, from the employer's side um, and issue a, a, a determination. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question, Mia? I think so, yes. Um... And is it, I've heard people or when I've helped employees, advised employees, they've said, oh, you can't sue for discrimination until you go through the Human Rights Bureau, the EEOC, but that's not 100% true, right? That's not, that, that's, okay. that's not true. Um, okay. what, you, you know, when people file through our Human Rights Bureau, they're exhausting their state, admin, um, their um I, it's just on my mind. They're uh, they're exhausting their administrative, uh, right. their yeah their rights. Um, but they can go ahead and sue. They can take um, the claim to uh, district court. 
wherever the discrimination occurred and, and they can file through the district court as well. And really we have a, um, a work sharing agreement with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC. So people oftentimes get confused. Well, where should I, who should I file with? Mm -hmm. Who should I file a complaint with? Either the Human Rights Bureau or the EEOC. It really doesn't matter um, because we are, you know, we're, we're partners and we, um, we receive payment on behalf of um, the EEOC for claims that they would take on for us. So, um, you know, why file with us? Well, we really get, we really do the investigation. Um, we do not take as long as the EEOC. Right now, we have a statutory obligation of, of uh, completing the investigation within 300 days. Uh, the EEOC right now, if you file a claim, it's taking about seven years. So that just kind of gives people some perspective of wow. um, the length of and, time. And speaking of that, it, you know, going to you all first, because there are deadlines mm -hmm. to your, you have time limits, which yes. might not be the same in employment law. So yeah. Okay. And also um, folks, <clears throat> folks can be sent to the Modest Means Helpline. Mia, can you talk a little bit about that I since I have laryngitis? <laughs> yes, we at the Modest Means Helpline helped. It is very confusing to navigate. There's so much going on in this horrible time of their life and they're now, now they have no income and they just can't see, uh, you know, uh, forest for the trees, the trees for the forest. So we kind of can help um, give a guide on where to start and what to do. And, and part of the advice is, is always to check with the Department of Workforce Solutions, um, Human Rights Bureau, Unemployment Division as well, and possibly consult with a private attorney. So we, we help um, just kind of uh, triage some of that. And so they, they leave the, the call having a plan. And, and that was better than when they started. And then of course you all do the follow through, which is awesome. So thank you for that. Um, and then I just had one other question because I had this come up. Must a nonprofit corporation pay into unemployment? Um, how does, is, is that a, something it, they it, have? It, it depends, but I know that most um, nonprofits do, do pay in. If you're they an do. employer, yeah, and if, you, if you're an employer and you have, I want to say it's more than two employees, um, okay. I'm not exactly sure, but yes, we do have nonprofits um, paying into unemployment insurance. Yes. Goodness, that was all of my questions. Let me see if there's anything else in the Q&A. Yes, people have been given information about needing to exhaust that administrative process before they can go to court, and it seems that is not altogether true. So at this time, if there are no further questions, I want to express MMH's uh, deep thanks for the Department of Workforce Solutions and all of your collaboration in making this presentation possible, giving all this awesome advice to small business owners across the state. As I said, this is recorded. It'll probably be up on the web on the New Mexico State Bar website within the next couple of days. Well, thank you. We thank you for inviting us as well. Okay. Take good care. Thanks, all. everybody.